the awesome work that was done down in the Portuguese about local selection and broadcast spawning forms. So this process is going to begin with spawning. This is a colony of Metatria cavernosa releasing gamete bundles into the water column. And it does this uh, in a mass spawning event that is synchronized based on the lunar cycle. And when it does this, along with all the other colonies around it, the next morning, we <coughs> see something like this, where literally millions of eggs and sperm and newly formed embryos are forming this slick on the surface. Mm -hmm. Those embryos will develop into the only dispersive stage that the coral has, these planule larvae that float in the water column and can disperse for tens and up to even before they find an appropriate habitat to settle in and metamorphose, and then began growing into a new juvenile colony. That juvenile colony can then go through further clonal reproduction to give us a reproductively active adult. And the salient features I want to point out about this life cycle are one, we only have one dispersive stage, a really strong, a really uh, wide dispersal capability, and then a very long amount of time to reach sexual maturity. This is between five and 10 years to go from that recruit. And that's going to really influence how these things can locally adapt to their environments. And the other main feature I want to point out is that in the ocean, it's, it can be more difficult to get local adaptation because the geographic barriers that we picture limiting gene flow in a lot of terrestrial, envi terrestrial environments are not going to be there. And so there's no real certainty that a uh, larva coming from one habitat will necessarily recruit back to that same habitat. So it's difficult to get local adaptation genetically without being swamped out by gene flow. But we have a hypothesis on how this could occur, and uh, that's what I'm going to look at today. And it really goes along the lines that you can get genetic local adaptation through purifying selection due to habitat mismatch. And our scheme is essentially, uh, we're imagining that there are two habitats, we'll call habitat A and habitat B, that are environmentally distinct and have unique selective pressures. And then that can result in genetically distinct individuals indicated by the color differences of those coral icons. And we're also going to assume that recruitment to these populations is uh, totally random. So there's no reason that if uh, one larva came from one habitat A, there's no reason that it would necessarily re recruit to habitat A. So we picture that recruitment is from this homogeneous larval pool. And initially, at the very first moment of recruitment, uh, all those recruits are genetically homogenous. Then through time, natural selection will winnow down the genetic diversity in each cohort until your juveniles show some level of genetic divergence. And then by the time you reach adulthood, when we've had much more time for selection to occur, we have genetic divergence. And then a final interesting thing is that the larvae are dispersed, but during fertilization, that will only occur with the adults that are close by. So we actually get assortative mating that occurs after the selection has gone down so that the larvae produced from each population will match the adults. And there are a number of predictions that uh, this scheme would make, but the two that I'm going to look at are one, that there even is genetic divergence between um, spatially very close but environmentally distinct habitats, that it's not being entirely swamped out by gene flow. And the second is that we will see a similar, a similar level, similar divergence in the juveniles, but it will be weaker than we see in the adults, indicating the fact that selection has had less time to work on. And finally, because this genetic divergence is occurring, that doesn't necessarily have to be across the entire genome. In fact, we actually expect to see no structure at the majority of the genome, and then only at those low side that we assume are selectively important for these habitats that we'll see divergence. So to address this, we went down to the Florida Keys off Summerlin Key and chose three habitats, an inshore site, an offshore site, and a deep site. And inshore sites are the closest to shore and generally thought to be the less ideal habitat. You're closer to human impacts. You have generally uh, cloudier water due to runoff and also a higher range of daily temperature. Offshore sites are supposed to be more, pris more pristine. They have less daily range of temperature and less exposure to human contact. And then the deep site is going to be distinct from the other two. That these have a max depth of about 10 meters, whereas the deep site has a minimum depth of 20 meters. So we're going to have a substantial change in temperature and in light availability. So the idea is that the selective pressures of these three sites should be very distinct, even though all of these are actually within just a 20-kilometer radius. 
so probably too small to get any real specific selection that's maintained at those sites. And at each one of those groups, we sampled 40 individuals, 20 juveniles, which are the smallest possible colony, that's a chisel right there, um, that we can find and still identify to the species level. And then the adults are going to be the largest colonies we can find. So probably the largest juvenile is about yay big, and the smallest adult should be larger than the span of my palm. So there should be at least uh, 10 years in time between these ages. We genotype disease using 2B rat. This is our own flavor of rat sequencing that uses type 2B restriction enzymes. And it's convenient because at each recognition site, the enzyme cuts on either side, giving us these fragments that are all going to be exactly the same size. And we can ligate adapters onto those for sequencing. And that's convenient for assembly as well because they're all the same size and it makes it much easier to line them up and call those size. We don't have a genome yet for this species and so this is going to be a de novo rat analysis. And these are, this is a summary of the results we have so far. This is based on 107 samples that we have across all three habitat types. Uh, the dark blue are indicating individuals from the deep site, green indicates individuals from the offshore site, and red indicates individuals inshore site, and then adults are shown as squares and juveniles as triangles. And this is on based on all t almost 10,000 loci we got out of the uh, rat pipeline. And the first principal component largely separates uh, this deep cluster from the other two clusters. And that accounts for about 7% of the variation in, across all these loci. And actually we see there seem to be about three different clusters, although these are much less defined than this deep cluster over here. But when we try to segregate those based on habitat type, we find that there is actually a significant difference in clustering between these two. And what I'm going to um, call these is, this is because this is genetic space that we're describing, this would be the inshore preferring genotype, this would be the deep preferring genotype, and this would be the offshore but obviously these are not uh, foolproof at all. And so one of the questions we wanted to look at is, are, do juve are juveniles more likely to show mismatch between these two clusters than the adults? So we first just re-ran this analysis based on adults only and found that the clusters are a little bit more nicely defined. And when you run it based on juveniles only, they're more poorly defined and no longer significant. And so this is consistent with our idea that the juveniles uh, the, maybe some of these mismatches are juveniles that are under selection but have not died yet. And to actually do some statistics on these, I ran a cluster analysis on the second principal component and simply found that we could put a line right about here and call those two different clusters and just count out the number of juveniles that are mismatched and the numbers of adults. And it's consistent across both types, the number of juveniles uh, the number of mismatch juveniles is larger, and when you combine those together, that's significant based on Fish's exact test. And to finally look at some actual loci and see if that's also consistent with this idea of stronger selection, uh, apparently the adults than the juveniles, we looked, we took paralyzed FSTs for all the types of comparisons that we could make, and Based on this, we would expect if a locus is under strong selection, and this is the allele frequency in the adults from habitat A, this would make sense if this was the frequency in the juveniles from A, this was the frequency in juveniles from B, and this from adults in B. So that the largest differences between the adults and the juveniles are both intermediate, but moving in the same direction as the adults. And when we take the top 20 highest FST loci across all of those pairwise comparisons Hi. that we could make, we find that actually 13 of those 20 match that expected arrangement um, exactly. And so that would be highly unlikely to occur by random chance. And so we're pretty pleased with this and think this really could be evidence that um, the selective schemes and what you think is going on is really happening. And so to summarize, we're trying to look at local adaptation in broadcast quantum corals. It seems like it might be unlikely to occur because of the massive dispersal capability and how close together these environmental reefs can be. But we do find genetic divergence between adults, and we also find that there's similar divergence between juveniles, although less pronounced in adults, probably indicating that with more time that selection will continue and 
have greater divergence. And where we plan to go in the future with this is one, a longitudinal study where we actually mark juveniles and get their genotypes, and then based on which genotypes we think are the appropriate ones for these sites, we can track those through time and see if we can really predict which ones are going to be more likely to survive. And we also have a plan to do whole genome sequencing for this species, so that we won't have to do the de novo rat and act can actually get an idea of maybe which genes are under selection at these sites. With that, I'd like to thank the members of my lab and uh, members of the Moat Biological Research Station that helped me with my field work. possible and we do our best to try to avoid that because if you see sort of a spot that looks small but on an old looking skeleton we try to move away and pick a different one so we're confident that most of our juveniles are in fact um, pretty young colonies.